Welcome back to Learning with Merit. Today, we are not inside the command line streaming text at you. We're inside of a browser, and we're looking at this. We're gonna cover in this video what a web browser is, the common web browsers that there are, browsing the web and the different ways that that works, hyperlinks, the parts of a web browser, and finally, we're gonna look at some keyboard shortcuts to help us when we're browsing and messing around on the internet. All right, let's talk about web browsers. So what is a web browser or just a browser? Okay, this is gonna be a software op application that allows you to access and interact with information on the internet. And more importantly, it's gonna act as our client in the client server model. It's gonna send the request and receive the responses from the web server. So it's gonna send that response, that request out, it's gonna get back all of the stuff for the web page. It's gonna render that web page for us and allow us to interact with information on the internet. It's probably something you do every single day. Here I have five web browsers that I have downloaded, and these are not all of the web browsers that exist, but they are certainly five of the most popular. There's actually one more that's on here that I uh, am going to talk about, but cannot unfortunately download. It is Safari by Apple. Can't download that on a Windows machine. It only comes on Apple devices. So first things first, we've got these four right here, these four browsers. That's going to be Microsoft Edge, Chrome, Brave, and Opera. These are all based on the same underlying engine, something called Chromium. So I'm actually going to open up Chrome here. We're going to take a look over here on the left. This right here is the Chromium project. It is an open source project. Now, what does open source mean? It refers to a set of principles and practices surrounding the development and distribution of software. Its core philosophy is transparency and collaboration. So it's all, it's literally all about making sure that all of that code, everything that they've got there, anybody can look at and provide input and do things like that, right? So mostly when we think open source, what I like to think of is I can actually look at the code that goes into making it. There are a lot of really good reasons for that, but that's what open source is. Now, Chromium is that open source project that forms the basis of many of the browsers that are out there, including the most common browser right here, Google Chrome, this one right here. All right, you can actually download Chrome here. We'll go to the home and you see the little download button if you want Google Chrome. And most of us have probably done this at some point. Chrome is the most popular browser in the world. It is free, it's open source, and it is developed by Google. Our next one, which is also Chromium based, is Microsoft Edge. Now this one comes with every installation of Windows, whether it's Windows 10 or Windows 11 these days. It comes right in there built in. Of course, that means it is built by Microsoft. It is also based on Chromium, as I said, and it is a competitor with Chrome. If we look at some other Chromium based ones, we've got Brave. Brave is my personal pick for this one. Brave is a privacy-based um, browser that is also based on Chromium. It's sort of all around getting rid of the trackers and things that you're going to have constantly. It comes with automatic ad blocking built into the browser. It's pretty nice. You should take a look. Also based on Chromium, we have Opera. Opera is a browser that's sort of marketed as a gamer browser. And there's a lot of, I played around a little bit with Opera. There is a lot of customization op options, a lot of things you can do. So if you really like a highly customizable look and feel to what you're doing, Opera is probably a great choice for you. It's of course developed by Opera Software. It's well, need, well known for some of its unique features. Like it has a built-in little VPN and tab stacking feature thing that you can do. Anyway, it's a very interesting little web browser. Now, on the subject of not based on Chromium, we've got two browsers here. One is Firefox. So we click on this, we've got different things we can do. Firefox for desktop, of course. Firefox has been in the game for a long time. It is well known as an open source web browser developed by the Mozilla Foundation. And it is also very well known for a focus on privacy and customization. So it has been the privacy browser of choice for a very long time. Um, I also would recommend that you try out Firefox. You may find that you like it. Um, the last one on here is Safari. Now, unfortunately, I can't download it and play around with it here today, but Safari is 
developed by Apple. It is not open source, and so you're only going to find it on Apple devices. It's going to be iPhones, iPads, and Macs. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. There are many, many more web browsers out there. These are just by far the most popular web browsers, and I personally recommend you use one of these. If you get something a little more off the wall, it's not going to work as well, and I personally have messed around with all of these. I like them all fairly well. Of course, my favorite here being Brave. That's the one that I recommend. If I had to pick two, I would pick Brave and Firefox. All right, but we're working in Chrome today. The reason we're working in Chrome is Chrome is, of course, the most popular browser, so you're probably fairly familiar with it. Now that we know what the common types of browsers are and sort of what we're dealing with, we can take a quick look at all of them. If I open up Microsoft Edge here, you will see it looks something like this. Of course, it has a special load page that you want. It's going to ask you all kinds of questions, but it looks pretty similar to what we've already messed around with. If we look at Brave, of course, there are some customizations options in here. It's opening up my little tutorial or my little uh, uh, outline for the video here because I had opened that previously. But you can see again, it looks pretty similar. Uh, if we open up Opera, Opera is going to look a little bit different. There's a lot of stuff going on with Opera. We've got some side panels and some different little things. This definitely has a new feel, new look to it. And the last one we can take a quick look at is Firefox. Of course, Firefox, again, very similar to everything else we've been working with. They're all pretty much the same. You're not going to get um, a huge difference in the way they look. So all their functionality that you're used to is pretty much the same. Now that we know what we're dealing with browser-wise, maybe you picked one that you like, we need to talk a little bit about how those browsers go about browsing the web, right? So let's say we want a web page, right? We're going to perform that whole client request here. We have a little bit of a diagram with our client server model going on here. First thing we're going to do is our client, our web browser is going to send a web page request, right? And that's if you enter a URL into the address bar, you click a link, right? We're going to call those links hyperlinks. We're going to talk about those a little later, right? Your browser is going to send one of those HTTP requests, probably a GET request, right, to the web server that is hosting that page. And then the server, what it's going to do is it's going to receive that request, it's going to interpret what you want, and it's going to send us a response. In this case, it's going to send us the HTML first. So the server responds with the HTML code that acts as our framework or our skeleton for the page. And then the browser, of course, is going to want to download the new stuff that comes from that. Now, you could really think of this as the client is downloading the HTML code. So it sends a request, server receives the request, and sends the HTML to the client. Now, the next thing we're going to do is our client is going to send a resource request. Now, this is a vague word resource request here because there's a lot of things that it's going to be asking for. Could be images, could be the CSS to style the page, the JavaScript to make it interactive, videos, all kinds of different things maybe are going to go on there. So we get the skeleton back. We send a new request to get all of the fancy stuff, images and styling and interactive things back to the server. The server is going to find those and send those resources back to us in response. So download those things to our device. Now, the browser makes separate requests to download these resources from the original request. So it's actually a multi-stage process and sort of a, a loop, 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 loop. We keep making requests. We get responses, requests, response, requests, responses. We get all of the things necessary to actually build the page. Then it's important that we look at what rendering does. So here I have an image of a Google page that's been rendered onto the laptop here. Um, during this rendering, in the context of a web page, we're talking about um, taking the raw code, the HTML, the CSS, the JavaScript, and turning it into a visual representation like what you see here. And of course, you're probably watching this in a browser or on your phone or something like that, but if you're watching it in a browser, you have that, that page rendered in front of you right now. Now, once that HTML and all the resources are downloaded, that browser will rend or build the page visually so that you can see it. 
Okay, it's going to interpret the HTML, it's going to apply those stylings to the HTML, and then run any JavaScript code that creates that interactive web page. So things to do like click on buttons and, and fancy stuff like that whenever you click on a button. Now the last thing we need to think about is something called browser caching. Now a cache is a temporary storage area that's going to hold frequently accessed data or files. That's for quicker retrieval. So it acts kind of like a middleman. It's going to store information closer, meaning on our device, rather than having to send the request all the time. Because it does actually take time for those requests and responses to travel over the internet. So rather than doing that, we're going to keep that stuff close. So I made like a little uh, box here that we can stick all of that data in. We're going to cache that stuff. And this happens whenever you're on a web page, right? So if we make this a little bit smaller here. And now that we got that out of the way, if we open up Chrome, right, instead of, instead of me constantly having to go out and make the request, the browser will cache this stuff and reload it really quickly. And so since it's sort of stored, it will be right there at hand. It doesn't have, it doesn't take as long to go out and get it. So rather than resending the request every time, we don't need to do that. And if I exit out of all of this and then open it up again, you'll see that Chrome even does a little bit of caching to open up all these pages again. But it's a little slower that time as we reload all these pages and send those requests. Okay, so now we talked about caching. We know what that is. It's gonna speed up our future visits. Okay, it's gonna store some of that important information and that way we don't have to download again. And one of the things you'll hear people talk about is um, if you're having an issue, you need to clear your cache and we will talk about how to do that in just a minute. Next, we need to look at hyperlinks because these are things we're going to see all the time. We know how to sort of browse the internet. We've got all the basics down. We need to add a URL up here. We're going to send some requests, get some responses. It's going to render the web page. And here it is right in front of us. I have made a search on Google using their search engine for hyperlinks. A little ironic to search about hyperlinks while looking for hyperlinks. But anyway, uh, um, if we look here, what we will see is... While you can get hyperlinks and make hyperlinks in a lot of ways, Google is a large area where you can find a bunch of hyperlinks. Anytime you do a Google search, you'll see all kinds of links here that you can click on on their web page to go to different places. Now, you think of Google as a search engine, but really what this is is it's just a web page designed to show you other web pages and give you links to them. So we have a hyperlink there. And if you'll notice, it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard. If you look in the bottom, it's literally right over here. If you look in the bottom, when I hover over this link, you can actually see where it's taking me to. I can look at some of these other places, like here. You'll see it's taking me to Wikipedia. There. Um, let's see what this one says. This one says developer.mozilla.org, right? And that's actually a really useful feature, especially if you're not sure where a hyperlink is going to take you to. It's good to hover over them. So what are hyperlinks really? Well, these are going to be clickable references to data that's going to direct you to another location typically. It's either going to be in the same web page or maybe in another web page, but it's going to take you somewhere else. Right? It's like a digital shortcut. Instead of me having to remember this, I can just click on a link to take me to wherever that is. And this is how most of us experience using the internet these days. We don't really remember websites, right? We go to some place like Google. In fact, I'd say for most people it's Google. And we type in a search and we get a page of links. And Google is really the only web page that we remember, right? Because it can take us to all of the other web pages with this. Now, there are two parts to every hyperlink. This is going to be the anchor text. This is going to be the text that I see right here, like creating hyperlinks, learn web development, MDN, right? That right there. That is the anchor text. The link that you see at the bottom that appears whenever I hover over, hover over, see right there, it hover over, hovered over, and it showed up, is the URL, that uniform resource locator. That's the actual address that it's going to take us to. That contains all the data that we need to go where we want to. So if I click on that, you'll see that it appears up here in my address bar and takes me somewhere. And, and here it comes and talks about creating hyperlinks in HTML. 
we will look at that in the future. Don't worry. Um, now, there are two types of hyperlinks. There are internal and there are external hyperlinks. Um, now, you can sort of think of these as like, let's click on this one. You see how it took me there? If I scroll down, let's say here. I'm really, well, it's actually taking me to a different page. But the point is here, there are links that take me to the same place in the page now, or to a place on the same page. This is going to be called an internal hyperlink. Right. If it's taking me somewhere else, right, entirely different website or different online resource, that's going to be an external hyperlink. So if I go back to Google, this is all pretty much all of Google's links are going to be external hyperlinks. They're going to take me to another web page. That's pretty much it for hyperlinks. They're pretty simple. You got your anchor text. You've got the URL that shows up in the bottom left-hand corner there whenever you hover. And there are internal, which takes you to something, a part of the current web page, and external hyperlinks that are going to take you somewhere else, like another web page. So let's talk about bookmarks. So what a bookmark is, is it's sort of like a large storage of hyperlinks that you create for yourself to help you get around places without having to go to Google and search up for them or you know maybe it's a harder to find link or something like that or it's some tool that you use a lot so you want to have a way of getting to it and there's a couple of different things we can do let's say we want to bookmark this page right here so what I'm gonna do is there is a little star over here but I also could hit control and D All right now I gotta make sure I'm clicked correctly on the page that has the focus I hit control D and it Book, bookmarks the page for me. Now, what it'll do is it'll just automatically bookmark it. And I see the little star and nothing else. Well, in order to actually see my bookmarks, I can hit Control Shift and B. And what I'll see whenever I hit Control Shift B is there is the all bookmarks bar, right? And it looks like, let's see, that one right there takes me right back to this. But let's change what's going on here. So I'm going to come here in the settings and we've got bookmarks and lists and different things we can do. Remember, Control D is going to be bookmark the tab. If we want to bookmark every tab we have, we can hit Control Shift and D and that's going to bookmark that. But here we have new folder. I'm going to call this one, I'm going to call this one browsers because I'm bookmarking all of the different browsers and I'm going to save that way. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to come here, come back and look at the bookmarks, right? And I can hide the bookmarks bar. I can show all the bookmarks. I can go to the bookmarks manager. I'm going to go to the bookmarks manager, and that's also with control, shift, and O there. Now, what I'm going to do is move this folder. Uh, let's see. It's got new folder in it. I'm going to rename this folder. So I right-click. I'm going to rename it. This one is going to be browsers and I'm going to move it to the bookmarks bar. I'm going to delete that other one that I did with right click and delete. So now, ooh, you see right there in the bookmarks bar, I now have a little list of bookmarks and I can move them around if I want to and change what order they're in and whatever I want to there. This is an extremely useful tool whenever you are keeping track of stuff. For example, here's what you could do. We go to bookmarks bar. Let's create some folders. So I'm going to right click. I'm going to add a new folder. Let's make it, I don't know, first hour, right? If you have a class in first hour, you could put, I don't know, let's go and find a lot of, a lot of people use Google Classroom. Google Classroom like this. And we'll just go and, whoops, we'll click on this. Here's Google. We'll just use this as our link for Google Classroom. I'm going to click here, and it's going to save it to the bookmarks bar, but maybe I don't want to do that, so I'm going to click Edit, and instead of the bookmarks bar, I'm going to tell it to go to first hour, and boom, there we go. Now, under first, first hour, I can just click on there, and I have all my links for my first hour class, right? I can just go straight to it. Now, I can do all my classes that way, and I could do all kinds of different things with the bookmarks. If I don't want to see my bookmarks right now, I'll just hit Control Shift and B, and they go away. And if I want them to come back up, hit Control Shift B, and they come back. So that's bookmarks. Extremely, extremely useful. I use them all the time. Cannot recommend 
uh, bookmarks enough. Very, very helpful when using the browser. So next, let's look at the parts of a web browser. There are a lot of things going on in most web browsers and maybe a little bit of it's confusing, but it's actually not that difficult. Um, you probably use most of this stuff every day. Let's just give some of these things some names. So if we look up here right here, this thing that I'm grabbing is called a tab. Now if we look at the browser itself, this thing, this whole thing right here, I'm actually going to dra drag it to the side and sort of highlight it a little bit. This thing is the window. And in the window, right, we are going to have lots of little stuff. But your operating system is there for creating these windows. And then our browser is going to take over with sort of what we put in these windows. So this is a tab right here. You've met, And I've got some pinned tabs up here. It makes them a little bit smaller. And you can always see those different browsers that we're talking about today. Now this thing up here, this little black bar that you see, this thing is called the title bar. Now the title bar okay, doesn't have much on it. Um, it's going to show the tabs. It's going to show these three little icons here you're probably very familiar with, but maybe you don't know what they're called. This tiny one here is called minimize. This one is maximize or restore. So if I click on that, you see it takes it back down. And if I hover back over again, you'll see it says maximize and that maximizes it makes it full screen and then of course we have close over here on the bottom or in the top right hand corner and we have some other things that we need to look at this right here is called the address bar and most address bars today also act as a search bar they do this they do two in one right you can use it to search google or whatever the default uh search engine that you set for your uh, browser is we'll talk more about search engines in a future video um, we have a couple things like here to reload the page. This is going to be our back and forward button in our history. We'll talk a little bit about our history today. This area here in the middle that you see me moving my mouse around is called the page body. Right? This is where all of the stuff is going to show up and that whole that word body right there is going to be very important in the future especially with HTML. HTML has a body tag where we stick all of our code that we want to sort of show up in the body of the web page. So that's what's going on there. Over here on the right we have a few things that are going to be important. We have the settings. We're actually going to look in uh, several things like the developer tools today and we will also look at extensions, look at bookmarks, we're going to do several things there as well and of course look at some more settings. We also have extensions which is right here. I can click on this little puzzle piece that's going to show me the extensions I currently have installed. I can manage those extensions and we will talk a little bit about extensions as well. Okay, so we're talking about the parts of a browser. Right, and let, we, we already looked at all the little things that we can click on here. Let's talk about first, let's talk about the settings. So we're going to click right here, up here at the top, and we're going to click on this. We're actually going to go to the actual browser settings. And these are going to be some, we're not going to go through literally everything. We're going to talk about some of the more, more important things, things like appearance or whatever and stuff like that. We can all sort of figure out our own. We can see, okay, you know, let's make this look good, this look this way. We're going to click show bookmarks bar, right? You'll see there's no bookmarks right there. You can go through and most of these are pretty self-explanatory. Maybe what's not so self-explanatory is some of the other things up here. So autofill in passwords. This is going to be a password manager built into your browser. I personally recommend that you do not use it. You use a separate password manager and do not use the one that is built into your browser. This is when you log into a web page and it is going to ask you like, hey, do you want to save your password? Yeah, I usually recommend that you do not do that. It makes your life easy, but it also makes it easier for people to steal that type of information if it's stored somewhere easy. Now, privacy and security is where we're mostly going to spend our time today. There are several things on here that we want to talk about. First of all, browsing data. So browsing data, this is where you, you know, people think of clearing your history, but there are a lot of other things that you can do here that are important. 
browser history is going to clear the things that you've looked at, right? It's going to get rid of the history, but also very importantly, it's going to get rid of cookies and other site data. We're going to talk about cookies and it's also going to clean up your cache here as well. And you can do that for all time. You can also come in here in advanced and do some other things as well, including any passwords that are saved, any autofill data that is saved. Your browser likes to keep track of things that you type and, and, and do it's to make your life easier, but it also uh, will store that information that can, that can be a little uh, uh, dangerous sometimes. And then, of course, specific settings for particular sites. So we'll just go ahead and clear all that. Um, Third-party cookies, you can go and look at some of the settings for these things, like do you block all, all third-party cookies, that sort of thing. Okay. But mostly this clear browsing data is what we need to know uh, to clear our history and clean our cookies out, clean our cache out. This is going to be very important whenever you have an issue. All right, if you're ever having a problem, that's always a good first place to start. Clear your cookies, clear your cache, restart the browser. Let's see where it goes from there. You can look at security. There are some things in security that are basically just little check boxes. Um, we're gonna talk about certificates, these SSL uh, and TLS certificates that are important. You will actually be able to look at some of these that are held in Chrome, and we'll talk about those in just a minute. And then site settings. These are extremely important because one of the things that likes to happen is you can go to a website and you click on it and it is able through a little exploit to automatically send you push notifications and you'll get them right down here in this little notification bar. It'll look like you're getting hacked or Windows Defender is telling you that the world end of the world is coming. You click on it and then you click on the wrong thing and then suddenly you've got some actual bad malware. All right, got to be really very careful about that sort of stuff. So here's where you can reset those permissions and mess around with things like that. You can change which sites use JavaScript because JavaScript is usually how they implement those types of exploits. They use the JavaScript to run in your browser, and that can be dangerous. Okay. You can affect some things like what sites can show images as well, pop-ups and redirects. You can prevent them from sending you to a, another site or sending pop-ups that type of thing to your computer. So privacy and security is definitely your friend. It's the best thing. One thing you might want to do is on startup, you can change to continue where you left off or on a specific set of pages, or um, you can just open on a new tab page. The rest of this is fairly uh, self-explanatory. We will talk about extensions as well in just a minute. All right, let's talk about our developer tools now. So up here in the right-hand corner, we can click on this little settings, uh, little settings three dots, right? And we can come down here and we can click on more tools and we can find developer tools. Alternatively, you can also hit Control Shift I or you can hit my favorite, which is F12, and it will open up the dev tools for you. Now it went ahead and opened these up full screen for me. I'm going to go back to where it default does. I'm going to click on the three dots here, and we're going to change where it attaches to. Now, right now, I usually use it as it's a separate window, but it usually defaults as something that looks like this right here. It's attached to the right-hand side. You can change it to be a separate window, to be on the left, to be at the bottom, whichever you prefer, whatever is most comfortable. Um, we'll use this right now because this is the default one. Now, there are a couple of things we need to talk about when using the developer tools that are important and they're going to be important as we move ahead learning about the internet and how we use browsers and how we develop for websites. First of all, the first thing that we see here is the Elements tab. Now, the Elements is going to be an HTML document. HTML is what actually forms the backbone or the skeleton of a web page here. And so you see as I hover over stuff, it tries to, it tries to highlight different parts of the web page to help me sort of see what is creating that part of the web page. If I want to do the opposite of that, if I want to hover over here and see this, I can click this little tool right here. It says Select an Element in the Page to Inspect It. And I'm going to click on that, and if I hover over it, you'll see that it, it both tells me information about that as well as showing me the part where it shows up over here, right? And same thing, you'll see that both sides are changing as I hover over different parts. If I click on a part, it will highlight it over here. I can drop down, ooh, and look at that, that right there and that right there. So the exact same thing, 
very useful tool. So remember, elements and HTML are gonna go together. We also have over here, the styles. Styles and CSS are gonna go together. That's cascading style sheets. Now, this is to inspect and edit the CSS styles and, that are applied to each element. So, the background color is this sort of off-white color, right? And we can see that right there. We can look through all kinds of things. And in fact, this right here is gonna be very important later on when we start talking about how our web page is actually built whenever we make our own with HTML and CSS and JavaScript, this little diagram is gonna be very, very important to understanding how you build those web pages. So HTML, CSS, those are only two of the languages that actually help us build a web page. Now there is yet another one that would be JavaScript or JS if you like, limiting it to two words. We're gonna click on sources here. And if we click on this, you'll see it, really all there is is just a index web page here. There's really not much going on. If I reload the page here, let's see what pops up. Um, it doesn't look like there is any JavaScript in this page. And I, normally I would find it under sources. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna see if we can find a page with some JavaScript. And let's go to everybody's favorite goof off during class website coolmathgames.com where I can guarantee you there is some JavaScript going on. So let's see what we got here. We've got a lot of stuff that popped up. Um, let's see if we can find, oh look at that, first thing I clicked on. You see that .js right there? That tells me that is some JavaScript right there. So I'm gonna drag this over to be take up more of the page and I'm gonna drag, let's see, drag this down. And drag this over just a little bit. All right, and you can see here in the middle, this is JavaScript. And there's some things, we're gonna talk about JavaScript later. Of course, we're creating a function here and we've got something called a for loop there. There's an if statement there. Um, we got var, var is for creating a variable. All kinds of things JavaScripty going on here. And of course, we will talk about JavaScript and how that works in the future. But under the Sources tab is where we can find the things that are loaded into the page. And of course, we can find the JavaScript for things like, oh, look at that. Um, that <laughs> that's actually kind of funny. Advertisement ads.js var is ad blocker on equals false. Uh, that's kind of funny. Anyway. So you can look at some stuff like that. Ooh, look, I found a little image. This, ooh, this is a really tiny, really tiny image, a one by one uh, image. That's actually, I think they're probably using that as part of an ad block detector. Anyway, um, that's kind of interesting, but off topic. Anyway, so point is we can look through this and we can actually see all of the little things that are getting downloaded into our stuff. Like there's the Cool Math Games icon we can look at different things and you really just can mess around with all the stuff that gets loaded into the site and see what's going on um, with all of it. There's a couple more Cool Math Games logos and icons and, and you can download those images and, and look at all that sort of stuff. It's pretty cool. Anyway, so there's sources and that's going to be all of those resources. So you remember we talked about that earlier. We download those secondary resources after we get all of the HTML. Now, one that we've looked at before is network. So we can see uh, sort of how fast and we can look at the headers and the information for stuff like, um, look right there, we've got the towerdefense.svg. That's an that's a, uh, image for a, looks like for a tower defense game. Um, you can see all of these different things that we loaded in just by going to this website. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff that showed up. Uh, a bunch of JavaScript looks like lots of lots of images all kinds of things that got loaded as we moved into there's some gs uh, or css files and things like that anyway so we loaded a bunch of stuff and that's what network is going to do it's going to it's going to capture all of that uh traffic so the git and the response in, in this case the request and response i should say um, all of the headers for that and then the information and all of that. So you see the response and we see some different things like that. You can even look at some of the cookies right here that maybe we got. So speaking of cookies, let's go look at some cookies. 
But before we look at some cookies, one last thing with the JavaScript. Um, this right here is called the console. This is where you're going to get some error codes and some things that have to do with the JavaScript. Anything that the JavaScript is supposed to log, you will see here as well. We are going to use this whenever we start running our own JavaScript to see some output from our JavaScript files whenever we are working with them. So last part of the developer tools we're going to talk about here today is under the application heading here and under storage. And we're going to look at something called cookies and we're going to take a look at the cache as well. So this is where we store uh, cached information, stuff that we get from the page that is either going to be stored over uh, multiple web browsing sessions or over just one or right, a lot, lot of little things that we're storing and um, using. What a cookie is, is it's a small text file that's actually stored by websites on our device, right? And it's gonna remember things like preferences, login information, and tracking data. Here's a great example. So if I click on cookies here, and I just went to Cool Math Games, everybody's favorite, you know, mess around at school um, instead of doing our work. And what you'll notice here is I have two cookies here, one of them that says AR and one that says US. Now here's what I'll tell you. It had more than this a minute ago, right? It actually it actually located further in than just AR and the US. So you never know. Why is Cool Math Games tracking my location with a cookie? That is that is an interesting thing to know, right? And so you know, and furthermore, how are they using it when they're tracking me with that cookie? And how long is that going to, to stay on there? Anyway, it, it's an interesting thing to think about. But these cookies are going to be these little text files that are added to your device so that when you leave and come back to the website, the website knows something about you, right? So, and sometimes that can be really useful because we might use cookies for, you know, remembering some of your preferences and, and, and changing how the website behaves. So anytime you have an issue, it's usually a good idea to clear the cookies and clear the cache, right? It's the first thing I always try when I have a web, website issue. Now, up here, we've got local storage. Local storage is going to store anything that's going to occur past this session. Now, what a browsing, uh, what a browsing session is, there's actually lots of different, uh, uh, ways that session gets used in uh, different contexts. But for the way we're explaining it now, a browsing session is going to be what I'm doing right now. If I hit this X, I have ended my browsing session. When I open a new uh, browser, I've started a new session, right? So anything that needs to be stored across multiple sessions is going to be stored here in local storage. And what you'll see right now is there's nothing there for cool math games. Right, the session, session storage is going to store anything that needs to be stored while I'm still browsing in the current session. So I've got the window open, I'm still using the browser and doing that sort of stuff. That's what session storage is going to do for us. We're going to ignore these two right here. Um, cookies, of course, you can see the different cookies that you have. And of course, any of these little disturbing tracking cookies from a cool math games website. And then we're going to ignore these two for now. We can look at shared storage. There's really nothing there. And then, of course, cache storage also has nothing there at the moment. But if I needed to clear some things, I can also come up here. I can look at cookies and site data from this little tab. And you'll see looks like managed on-device site data. And um, cookies and site data says some things about that for us. I can click on this and manage it. I can click here and delete any cookies that we have. And then if I look here, you'll see that all of the cookies have been deleted. All right. If I reload the page, the cookies are going to come back and we're not going to look at those for now. Okay. So that's the last thing that we're looking in for the developer tools. Just to recap on everything that we have, we looked at elements, which is going to have all of the HTML styles is going to have the CSS for the page. The console is going to read out stuff from the JavaScript that is run. And we're going to see things like issues from that as well. Sources will allow us to see all of the additional resources that get loaded in after we request the HTML. And you'll see things like the JavaScript that gets loaded in as well. We can take a look in through that. 
Network is going to show us all of the time that it takes. We could filter some of that traffic. It's going to show us all of the stuff that gets requested and sent back. We can look at all of the different little files that get downloaded just to go to this one page on this one website as we go. If we look further in and look at application, we will see the local storage, Sessage storage, cookies, and cache. And we can look around with all of that sort of stuff and determine what gets used and when. All right, let's take a look at some security in the browser. So this right here is what we call a site certificate. It's an SSL or TSL cert or TLS certificate, I should say. And this is all about a way of verifying, right, the identity of a website and that there is some sort of secure communication. So we're gonna use um, example.com as I use quite often. Right, and that certificate is issued by a third party we call a certificate authority. So if we take a look at this, up here we can find, and this is it's gonna be pretty much the same place in every browser. You'll click on this, you'll see connection is secure. There may be a lock icon you can click on. Um, you'll see it says certificate is valid. Let's actually view the certificate. So here is the certificate right here. And as we look at this, there are some things to think about. So there's issued to, issued by, the validity period, um, and then these two things down here, which are really important, but not very well um, understood. So SHA or SHA-256 okay, is a cryptographic hash function. You can look up uh, what that is basically, but it takes some digital data as an input and then generates a unique fixed length 256-bit output string. That's why it's called SHA-256. And there's other ones like uh, SHA-512 and, and uh, ones that you can look at like that. But anyway, it's a unique uh, fixed length piece of data that we get out, right? Now, what it is is it's sort of like a digital fingerprint that uniquely identifies the original data, right? So no matter what I stick into this hashing algorithm, I will get a unique value out, right? It doesn't matter how long it is, how much of it is, there is, I will always get a unique value out that is of a fixed length. All right, so that's that's what that does. Now, what does this all mean? Why is it what, what's a certificate? What's a public key? So the certificate is sort of like a digital identity document. You can you can sort of think of it as like the papers for a website, right? Um, and here here's how it works. It gets issued by the third party we call it a certificate authority. Right, and what what goes on is in this certificate, it's going to contain, contain some information about who owns the certificate, the website, example.org, right? The public key of the owner, which is important, which here's the public key down here of the owner, and then the signature of the certificate authority, which is a dig digital signature. It's not like a signature that you write down on paper, right? This is a little bit different. Now, the way that that works is the the website will create its public key and private key, right? And this, this has to do with how they um, actually store the data, but they will ask for the certificate authority to verify them and, and, and say that they're a good website. So they'll send a request to their certificate authority and the certificate authority will verify their identity. And then what it will do is it will create this certificate. It contains the public key of the website, right? It's going to contain the digital signature of the certificate authority, right? And it's going to contain some more information about the certificate holder um, as well. And what this does is it gives us a sort of a way of proving they are who they say they are and the information that they provide. And we can go more into detail of what I, what it's actually going on here, but we're not going to because that's just a little little too uh, uh, complicated to get into right now. 
um, with what we're talking about. But basically, this proves that they are who they say they are. This is a public key that is used to send information to them, and you can use this and this to prove everything, basically. That's what we're doing. And of course, it has to be updated every so often because otherwise you just update it once, then they become a horrible website and um, you never have to prove going forward that you're a good website. You can also look through the same stuff right here in the details viewer. So that's what these certificates are for. If you ever see one that is invalid, that's not necessary necessarily the worst thing in the world, um, but I probably wouldn't go to that website, um, especially if you don't know that where you're going, that's a perfectly okay thing to have occurred. So certificates, pretty simple. Um, they're really just about verifying the identity, identity, of web, uh, identity of a website, if I can speak, and to make sure that that is going to be a secure form of communication for you. And you want to think about this. This is important for things like bank accounts. If you're spending money, if you're going on Amazon, Walmart, you know, wherever, wherever you're actually spending your money, right? If you're doing it online, you want there to be a secure communication, uh, you know, transit pathway, and you want it to be encrypted because if it's not, then somebody um, might be able to steal it. All right, the last little thing we're going to look at here today is um, browser extensions. So let's say you want to add some functionality to your browser. And for most of the Chromium-based stuff, you can go to the Chrome Web Store. And here is where you can find a lot of extensions. Now, you need to be very careful, even on the Chrome Web Store, a lot of extensions can contain malware and different things like that, and you just want to be careful when you're adding an extension to your browser and giving it permission to do things. Here's one that I really like. Um, it's called uBlock. It is an ad blocker, and it does more than that. It isn't just an ad blocker but it's very good for stuff. So I'll remove it from Chrome real quick uh, and I'll just click remove here and let's go ahead and add it back. So it's as literally as simple as clicking add to Chrome and you'll say go ahead and add the extension and it will download and go and install it for you pretty easily. And then I can click on this little pu puzzle icon here and I can go to manage extensions and I can see all the extensions that I have. I can turn them on, I can turn them off. I can do all kinds of things with this. But these are just extra little functionality tools that I wanna add. And I can even pin some of them, so I can pin this one right here to the bar so that I can turn it on and off to help me block ads and do all sorts of things with it like that. So that's pretty much it for extensions. It's just whatever uh, whatever you want to add in. Um, they're also known as plugins or add-ons, right? They modify the behavior of your browser. They're pretty easy to add, um, fairly easy to also remove most of the time. You just need to be very careful with what you're actually um, installing when you're using an extension. All right, last thing we're gonna look at here is some shortcuts that we can use whenever messing in the browser, mess around in the browser, right? For simple navigation, here's what we've got. We've got Alt-D will move us to the address bar. So if I hit Alt-D, you'll see it takes me right to the address bar. I wanna reload the page, you can hit F5 or I can hit Control-R. That's always a good one and it'll reload the page for us right here. Um, if you do Control and F5 or Control Shift R, this will reload the current play page, ignoring the cache. I cannot recommend how many times this will save you uh, whenever you are having a problem with a website, right? It will re download everything, it will fix that issue. If you need to stop loading the current page, you can hit Escape and then Alt Home will take you to your browser's um, home page. Um, working with the window, if you want to do control N, you can, that'll open up a new browser window. See if I hit control N right there. Um, if I do alt F4, that'll close the current window. If I hit control shift and N, it will add, open a new incognito window or a new private window, depending on what uh, browser you're using. Um, for tabs, if we hit control T, it will open up a new tab like that one. 
If we hit Control W or Control uh, F4, it will close it. So Control W uh, right there will close that current tab. Control Shift T will reopen the last tab. There it is right there, example domain. Um, if we do Control 1 through 8, so if I hit Control 1, it takes me to Chromium 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, right, 7, 8, and 9 will take me to the last one. I just so happen to have exactly 9 that time, so that will take me to the last tab. Um, for History, if I want to see what I've actually looked at lately, I can hit Control H. This will show me the current history. And then like a good, clean web browser, I am going to make sure to always clear everything because storing too much of that stuff can become a problem. And there we go, we hit Control W to get out of those. Um, Alt left arrow will take us back one page in the history. If I don't have anything, then it won't do anything. Alt right arrow will take you um, forward one page. If we wanna search, and I cannot recommend this one enough, Control F, learn how to use it. It will be super helpful for you. Let's find the word find, and you'll see, there it is right there, it's showing me all the word find. F3 also works, and Shift F3 is gonna help us find previous instances. So instead of having to go all the way to the end, you can use Shift F3 to go backwards. Um, if we wanna zoom the web page, Control plus will zoom, Control minus will zoom us out. And then let's say I don't know how much I've zoomed, hit Control zero, it takes me back and resets me. Bookmarks, if I want to bookmark something, I've got Control plus D here, and I've got Control Shift B. So if I wanna make a bookmark, like of this web page, for example, I can click on that and it will create a bookmark. And then last, if I wanna print the page, that is Control and P, just like that.